Welcome to Small Talk, where each week we sit down to discuss the sermon-based small group questions at Wallula Christian Church. Welcome back to Wallula's uh, podcast called Small Talk. We are excited that you are with us. Uh, I am. My name is Zach Bolin, and I'm taking over duties for Clayton Kaufman <laughs> as uh, host of the podcast. Uh, you, you weren't supposed to say anything. It was going to be the sitcom. Oh, we were brother, just yeah, yeah, yeah. His kid disappears. who just fell away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all right. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, who was that? Aunt Liv, or was it from Fresh Prince of Bel Air? Oh, yeah. Know, yeah. Know, anyway, she got replaced and name. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, we're off to a good start. <laughs> uh, I'm the student pastor here. I'm joined by Craig, uh, worship pastor, and Lance, our lead preaching boss pastor. Uh, we are all here and uh, excited to go through Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Um, so we're going to start off. I'm going to throw it to Craig first. And the intro question uh, is What is one thing about yourself that others are surprised is true? Uh, I don't know if I've ever told you guys this, so I don't know if it's surprising or not. We'll mm-hmm. see. But I've never flown. I've never been really? in an airplane. See, that's the response right there. Yeah. yeah. Why? Um, just mm. didn't, I guess, see the need or have right. the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I've I've road tripped to, I mean, I've been out to South Carolina to the beach. Mm-hmm. That's the furthest I've been. Right. I could have flown. For the mm-hmm. K-State band, they never flew you guys anywhere? No, we went on charter buses mm-hmm. to New Mexico and Texas. Wow. So, do you yeah. have any plans to I've, do that, to fly anywhere? I've been in a helicopter twice. Oh, Helicopter okay. tours. That's, that's, that's flying. That's like an added <laughs> layer. I mean, but like, <laughs> I've never that... flown like someone's like... <laughs> to somewhere else. They yeah. land in the same spot they start from. Right. I've never flown. I've just been in, a, I've been in something that, that goes in the hovering. air. Yeah, yeah, it's hovering. I hovered. Yeah. Yeah, they, in they North count, Dakota. They count that as flying. But yeah, yes, I know. But to, to a place. I've right. never boarded an airplane okay. through an airport. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But Haley's brother, Brady, so I'm going to call him out for a second. He's, he says, I need to fly. I have to do it. Mm-hmm. So he said, some year he's just going to buy me some round trip tickets to like Chicago because it's yeah. semi close. It would yeah. be cheap. Right. Just so I can, I can go there and maybe like eat a deep dish pizza <laughs> and come home just yeah. in the same day. Yeah. But. I'm still waiting for it. Yeah. So if Brady listens to this, <laughs> there you go. he's getting called out. There you go. <laughs> My kids, that's all they want to do. They just want to, we talk about vacations and they're like, we just want to fly. That's all. It, like they, they did it once when they were young, but that's really the only qualification they have for a good trip is just, can we get an airplane? So have they ever, uh, when they were like one and three. Oh, okay. So, and so they don't remember it. Yeah. And so now they're right. just, they just want to, they think it's so cool to do. Yeah. And so I guess it is if you haven't, you know, mm-hmm. you know, if you haven't done it before, yeah. You're, it's a big deal. Uh, I would say, um, actually, I'll go to Lance. I'll go last on this one. What do you got? Yeah. Um, so I was thinking a little bit. I, I feel like I uh, spill my guts pretty often around here. And so uh, I don't know if there's anything that's going to be super surprising. I was thinking, you know, what did I do when I was a little kid that maybe people don't know? And uh, I've talked about, I'm not very musically inclined, but I played viola when I was a little kid. People know that, I think, at least some. And I thought, okay, in church growing up, you know, we'd have these plays and mm-hmm. Christmas specials and all those things you do in church with little kids. In one year, I was not a little kid. I, I want to say I was like 14 years old, something like that. Maybe that's too old, but I was Salty the Songbook. Do you guys remember Salty the Songbook? <laughs> I don't think I do. <laughs> no? What's it from? It's like, it was like the Veggie Tales of... Mm. The oh, mid eighties. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. And, I was uh, cooking salt. No, yes, yes, Christian. No, like salty, yes. salty, like salt and earth. Right. But Psalm, salty, no, I, I, the yeah. song book. Yeah. And uh, it was a giant blue cartoon book. Did you dress up as a book? <laughs> yeah, I was a giant. I was a giant blue. <laughs> Did you have singing you know. parts that were just you? I, I uh, no, I don't remember s- singing even. Okay. I was a little bit older than the than most of the. Uh-huh. Participants in the which is great. Special. Everybody loves R- that, right? Yeah, <laughs> like I said, I want to say I was like 14, 13, 14. Maybe that's a little too old. Yeah, but I was a wow. giant salty the songbook. Yeah, that is yeah, that is a lot. Sure, of I thought you meant like 
sure. fifth grade sure. compared to elementary. No, I think I was a little older than that. Wow. Oh, one Christmas special, I did have a solo, a singing part solo. Whoa. I remember mm. that distinctly. Because That's surprising, too. That yeah. hasn't happened again. You talk a lot about not I, singing. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I shouldn't have. And that happened. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of like you where I was trying to think of stories that would be surprising. And I've told so many stories. Sure. This is I was ready for it. I'm like, there's all these so like, about you. yeah, so many. I I process through talking. So, I mean, I, I tell stuff that's not flattering and embarrassing all the time. So I was like, what would actually be surprising? So I tried to go the other way. And um, so something I do is if you've ever been in my office, not the tidiest. Mm -hmm. uh, my car is just manageable. Uh, I, I'm not known for my uh, organization, but uh, if you were to go in my house, in my uh, I have just t-shirts, like so many t-shirts from every event mm -hmm. I've ever gone to, and I don't know why, but I if you open my t-shirt drawer, it is I fold them as a square. Like I'm very like I don't let Maeve do this. And so I, ever since college, I, I fold them in a certain square and then I, I put them in face up so or sticking up so I can see the strip. And I I can like a, like envelopes or whatever. And I can have a filing system for my shirts and there's three rows. And on the, on the right side are the shirts that I either don't fit into or I'm like, <laughs> or I'm like, I don't want to get rid of because of uh, sentimental reasons. So, but I, they don't look good. I'm like, but I keep those. And then I have two others and it's this whole system. Like if you, uh, I remember in college, like some of my friends would goof around. They would run in my room and open the drawer and they'd start throwing the t-shirts <laughs> out one at a time. And it, I hated it because sure. I would take the time to fold it and, and insert mm. it back in. Uh, <laughs> almost, I can't think of anything else in my life where it, it's that way, but I've always been right. very specific about mm. my, my t-shirts, yeah. uh, very organized and... Uh, Zoe cleans our offices, uh -huh. you know, and she came home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm she, sorry, Zoe. I'm sorry she, for whatever I'm about to she, hear. She came home the other day. This and, summer's been rough. And mentioned your, uh, well, she mentioned a couple things. Oh, I'm sure. She's like, there's boxes, and I don't know if oh, he's yeah, saving them. Or, oh, no, no. Yeah. And then she said, and uh, I love his chewing gum oh, collection, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, she, <laughs> Sherry said, what? He's got <laughs> He's got this. I don't talk about it much. Statue of old chewing gum. I do. I've been yeah. collecting. I've been. I've been collecting. Uh, I have a chewing gum collection since August of 1999. See, did you bring that on stage once when you preached? Uh, I don't. Or maybe know. you talked about. It there was night. one time I thought, you know what? I've no. been doing youth ministry for at that time like 15 years. I said, there's a staff meeting. And I was like, I, mm. yeah, I need to grow up. Let me get rid of this gum collection. And it was Lance who said, no, no, you should keep that. And I was right. like, wow, ah, okay. And so, <laughs> Easily convinced. I just, yeah. Anyway, well, that was good. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about, you know, obviously things that, um, that surprised us is true about ourselves. And as we look at, um, we're still in the throne room of heaven uh, and obviously a lot of surprising things there. Um, and so we're just going to go through a couple of questions. One is, uh, you know, in, in number nine, it says, think, think through each of the characteristics describing Jesus in verse 12. Um, what is your takeaway from the list? And um, so as you look at it, uh, we see this transition of, um, in chapter four, they're worshiping God. And we see this worship to God. And now we're in, in chapter five, and it, it starts to go into uh, specifically Jesus as the slain lamb and the worship of Jesus now along, along with God. And we see this, uh, these characteristics of worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And is there anything unique about that list or anything that stands out? Um, I think for me, as I was, uh, trying to just and beyond just like, oh yeah, it sounds like what you would, you know, worship with. Is right. there anything that stands out? And so, um, uh, as I was doing some reading on it, noticing that once again, there's, there's a seven in there, right? There's, there's mm. seven characteristics mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, pop up. Is that meaningful or not? I, I don't know. I had a, a professor who talked about revelation and he's like, you know, when you think about the Chronicles of Narnia and he goes, we know that Jesus is... Uh, Aslan, right? And all this yeah. stuff. And then it says, but what about, you know, the beaver? Does that represent anything or is that just <laughs> something that's part of it? Does everything represent something? And so I don't know if that right. little mm -hmm. thing about seven is is unique, but it stood out. And I thought that was, a, if, if nothing else, a cool coincidence. But 
Um, some of the stuff that, you know, uh, as I was reading, it said that, you know, the first four uh, talks about the, the characteristics of Jesus and the last three are the sort of worship of him, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, another way to kind of divide it, but uh, just framing it in a different way. I don't know. Uh, some of the things that stood out is the power and strength. You know, that Mm -hmm. it it seems very similar, uh, that power has never been an attribute that has been listed before as um, a worship of of God or Jesus. And this was, I think they said the first time that you see that, like leading it and the idea of the the power that comes through. Uh, Obviously, not a physical power that Jesus showed, especially on earth, but the the power over evil and conquering uh, conquering that... um, conquering evil and conquering death, uh, we see his power shown and also strength. I mean, two things you don't normally think about with Jesus and you see him as, as two of the seven. Uh, also wealth was not one that, uh, is used to describe Jesus or his ministry. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think we're talking about a, uh, a wealth that we have as Christians on earth, but when you get into heaven, uh, the riches of heaven, the treasures of heaven, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of, you know, even symbolically the crown you have, um, but uh, ultimately uh, how much he, uh, how that's one of his characteristics, um, things that aren't normally used to describe Jesus. Uh, and then, you know, honor and glory and praise, uh, which like before is exactly what was going on with God in chapter four. And so we see these two as, as uh, both being worshipped in heaven. So that's some of the stuff that kind of stood out to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you? Yeah, the, the thing that kind of stood out is now that we've made our way into chapter 5, and, and this is at the tail end of this throne room vision, um, we kind of get a, a full circle or this, this full view of what John sees. And uh, just the, the words that get repeated or the language of worship. So you mentioned uh, honor, glory, and blessing being those last three uh, in verse 12 as far as praise. And if you go over to Revelation 4, uh, verse 11, um, glory, honor, and power, those get repeated, mm-hmm. same kind of language. Um, uh, I thought I had somewhere else. Oh, and then in verse uh, 13. Um, just following where we're at, what we're looking at, but blessing, honor, glory, and might forever and ever. Um, chapter four is talking about God on the throne, and then we get to five, and it's focusing on the slain lamb, Jesus, mm-hmm. um, and the worship that happens. And the language is the same, covering chapter four and five. And so it's really a testament to uh, worship of God, worship of Jesus. It's uh, the same. Um, Jesus as Lord, and so they're repeating that language. And so that stood out to me, um, just kind of how that vision gets brought across from four to five. Um, And then another thing that stood out in in one of the commentaries I was reading, uh, the author said, Revelation four and five is not offered just as a rational fact, but a compelling call for all readers to join in themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's just not something we we read Mm -hmm. and then we say, okay, cool. Yeah. And then we just, and then it's like, all right, I'm going to head, head out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really is, we can view it as an invitation. And that's a little bit what we did Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we finished right. with repeating the words that mm-hmm. are said in, in Revelation 5 and singing those together. And we're really joining into that song that's already being sung. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's really amazing to be able to view it that way and jump in mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was struck. I, I, uh, like you, Zach, by um, you know the the power and the might and uh, you, those Greek words, the, the worthiest Lamb who was slain to receive power. That's dunamis, mm-hmm. and so you know we get uh, the English word dynamite. Mm-hmm. Dynamic comes from that, um, and it's really that uh, dynamic power of God. It's used 121 times in the mm-hmm. New Testament. You know, certainly God is powerful, Mm all-powerful. And so that idea of that uh, kind of built-in might or power uh, makes sense. And then attributed to Jesus is Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, Mm -hmm. you know, and and different from, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it stands in contrast to that slain lamb Mm -hmm. here in Revelation chapter 5. But the other thing that stood out to me about this is like Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 
you know, when Jesus says, I want you to wait until you receive power Mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit. And it's the same Greek word, Mm -hmm. right? With, you know, we, you know, God's um, power is, is being worked out through the church, through a spirit, through his son, certainly, and uh, and so just interesting there. I, th- I thought uh, that that other word might is is the Greek word uh, iskus, and it it uh, means um, you know the staying power or your ability to hold on to something, mm. and uh, so the holding power of mm. God of Jesus that we are you know we talk about being in His hand or mm. or. Um, uh, that he, that he's faithful, that we can't, you know, that we can't run away from his love. All those kinds of ideas where he's holding on to us and keeping us, you know, safe. Next week we're going to be talk, talking about being sealed through difficulty and persecution, even, and that God is holding us and keeping us safe, and and pretty cool, I, I think. And then that, uh, you know, wealth is a Greek word that is often translated as riches, um, and and Different places like Romans chapter 11, I, I looked up verse 33, says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And so while we, we talk about and we think about, because we don't have better terms, I think, to, you know, the you know, golden streets of heaven or whatever. I, I think you're right. We're not really talking about material kinds of things here, but just the depth of God's love and mercy and grace and and how much he wants to share those things with us. And, and I, I love your point as well that, you know, that separation, I never thought about that, that, uh, you know, those last three are how we respond or, you know, how we offer that worship to him. And, um, yeah, just... Uh, that word honor is time in the Greek. It, it means money paid, it, you know, that mm-hmm. we give up something of that intrinsic value, those elders laying down their golden crowns. Um, you know, blessing is eulogia, which, you know, that sounds like our English word eulogy. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're giving these kind words. We're, we're mm-hmm. you know, honoring God with, with our words. So, yeah, he's certainly... Uh, reminds us of how much Jesus is worth our worship, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, as we uh, move on to question five, this one uh, really stood out to Craig, so I'm going to let you take it, but let me read it first. Okay. Um, it says, uh, in verse five, we are told that the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, overcome, or, triumph, or triumphed, depending on the translation you use. Uh, the word is the same one repeated uh, in the promise that conclude the letters to the churches in, in chapters two and three. So if we look at, especially in 321, um, so how are these triumphs all connected from like the the 321 to what we're seeing in in, uh, 5-5? Yeah. Um, And one of the reasons this stood out to me is uh, just seeing repeated words or patterns is is a big deal. uh, And then reading uh, verse 5 in chapter 5, and then going back to the letters, mm-hmm. it kind of just started to put it all together for me. So, um, real quick, I'm going to try to shuffle through the first the the, the messages to the seven churches. Just read it all. Just yeah, read two and three. We're just going <laughs> to we're just going to take a second here. Um, but yeah, you know, so I went back and I looked at uh, those statements, um, and it's really I realized too, like the the beginning of this, and we've talked about it um, for the the original readers and listeners of this letter, you know, they're in the middle of whatever the persecution or the, um, the pressure to bow down to political or emperor, whoever. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the midst of that uh, struggle or tension, it's really a message of encouragement once you see all these conquer, uh, conquering uh, messages of hope, and then you get to, to verse 5. So, um, so the first one says, to the one who conquers... I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise, uh, in the paradise of God. Uh, to the one who conquers, will not be hurt by the second death. Um, let's see, where's the next one? To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, that no one knows except the one who receives it. Um, the next one. Uh, 
got to find the word conquered because it's in all of them. <laughs> to the one who conquered and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Um, keep going. To the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and will never blot his and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And then uh, to the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And then this last one um, that was mentioned in the question, so 3.21, uh, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Mm-hmm. And then you get to 5.5, uh, five, five. Um, weep no more, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. And then we see that he's the one that has the privilege, the authority, the unique uh, duty of opening that scroll. Mm-hmm. Um, but with un- especially that last one, it's this invitation uh, through Jesus to to dwell with him, and not just dwell with him, but to be considered conquerors over mm-hmm. death, over evil, right. and then share in that rule and reign uh, in the new creation. And that that's a message of hope <laughs> when you read right. that. Uh, and we talked about how this can be applied. You know, it's the, the first century church. They were reading this, and it's a message of hope, and and they could look to it. And then we talked about any church through whatever century could mm-hmm. read this, and whatever they're in the midst of, they can look to this and find hope. Um, and it made me think, too, back to um, Genesis, when, when God gives the... The, I guess the orders of, of humanity and says you need to work the garden but to also uh, reign over the earth and that was mm-hmm. the original intention and so uh, I don't know I just this is my mind I've been pondering is this kind of just God's story playing out and we're working to towards this ultimate reality of um, what that looks like in perfection mm. um, so I don't know that's mm. just kind of where my mind went um, thinking about this question uh, throughout the weekend after the sermon. So, yeah. but it's just, yeah, to me, that's, that's a huge message of hope and encouragement. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, that was very thorough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. Uh, I, I was just thinking through uh, kind of even more in a simplistic way, I guess. But um, when we look at, uh, especially in 321, um, I will, you know, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Uh, and then we fast forward to, you know, couple chapters over to five and we see him on that throne Mm -hmm. you know we see him fulfilling Mm -hmm. that so each of the churches wherever they are and whatever they're going through he is giving them this promise and then we see the fulfillment of that specifically on the throne and really the imagery of you know the root of david and uh the lion of judah this this uh for the jews especially be reading this the the military language the uh the the fulfillment of uh jesus as conqueror but not through war Mm -hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But through his own sacrifice, as the lamb, literally, uh, as, it, as it says, the slain lamb, uh, we see him um, fulfilling this sort of paradoxical imagery of a slain lamb, but also a conqueror yeah. uh, through the lion and through the root. Uh, but yeah, he's fulfilling in, in five five everything that he said uh, in the rest of it, specifically 321. And so I just see that quick connection between those two. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but what about you? Well, I just think uh, I, I just think that the idea of overcoming, right? That depends on the translation you read, and maybe you know, the section that word, the same mm-hmm. same word is being translated, conqueror or overcomer. Mm-hmm. And uh, you think about you know all those folks in the seven churches who are overcoming, who mm-hmm. are conquering, and um, and uh, and then the the promise that we can overcome. And be conquerors and share in the reign and, and heaven be on the throne and that you know the restoration of perfection all those things and and just to me what stands out is that it, yeah but we're not really overcoming mm-hmm. <laughs> that uh, it, it's not our strength I, mm-hmm. I think that's part of the contrast too mm-hmm. between the 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 root of, of David and the lion of Judah and that anticipation mm-hmm. of of earning and conquering, and uh, even even the church sometimes we get this idea of uh, you know that we're gonna we're gonna show the world right and, a lot of military language <laughs> yeah, yeah like we can conquer mm-hmm. and, yeah, yeah that 
we're going to reign and and rule and and uh, we don't we don't do that by our strength mm-hmm. or whatever. Re- Revelation twelve eleven says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death, mm-hmm. right? And so that you know the the same way. The same way that Jesus has conquered, you know, mm-hmm. we have we have the avenue to mm-hmm. through through His forgiveness and grace and mercy and love, mm-hmm. and then sharing that love, uh, even to the point when somebody else persecutes us. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just it, kind of that contrast between how we typically think of winning, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and what. Uh, and what you know that Jesus has already won right. for us. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's cool that in the same way that it, it's encouraging for the churches back then, it's also still encouraging for us right. the same message that Jesus mm-hmm. is on the throne in that, uh, in terms of winning. But right. uh, this is eventually the the end, and it kind of leads into um, our last question, which is we're going in reverse order here. Question number one: What is your overall impression of this heavenly throne room as we look at especially four and five? Um, what does uh, this scene teach us about worship? Um, I would say, um, you know, I, thinking about a lot of times when I'm reading Revelation, I think, is this exactly what it looks like or is this how John wanted to communicate it? And then I take a further step back and say, if wh- whichever one it is, what does it still teach me? Whether it's it's symbolic or this is exactly how it will look, and um, and so the takeaway is if I'm just looking at this scene, or if it's just the idea of the scene, it's uh, uh, first off I just feel like it's overwhelming, like in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, we use the word awesome a lot, uh, mm-hmm. and we really don't do it justice. But mm-hmm. it, in this sense, I wrote down awesome in that it's full of awe. That everywhere around that I'm looking in in this imagery um, is the the feeling, the sensation of just um, seeing the, the, I guess, uh, other words we say, the majesty uh, of it all. And even um, another word that kind of popped up is just God's sovereignty, that as we are in the chaos and the mess of this sinful world, um, that we know where it's uh, how Jesus wins, you know, like we just said, uh, how it's going to end up and how this is God's plan, even in, even in the midst of this. Um, he still has a plan for it to work out this way. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, we're still going to be praising him along with the angels, along with the saints. Um, and so taking comfort in that. Um, and then also when it comes to, so that's sort of the impression. Uh, and then what does it teach us about worship? Um, is uh, a couple of things. Um, like I think I said this last week too. Some people look at it like, are we just going to be singing? <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's probably, you know. And then I thought, but then I kind of push back and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, wh- what if right. we are? Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's still going to be enough, even if that's it, you know. And so um, I don't know what it exactly will look like in heaven, but um, I know that it's not a have to, but a want to, mm. uh, that we were so overwhelmed with what we see and what we're taking in. Uh, and, and of what, aware of who God is and what Jesus has done. And so when I look at my own worship, I think the focus or trying to direct myself back to one, who God is, you know, as I focus more on the attributes of him um, and the holy, 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 recognizing his sovereignty, sovereignty and his holiness and trusting in him. And also in chapter five, the, the slain lamb, uh, looking at what Jesus has done um, and because I think we forget, like we know, oh, he died on the cross for my sins. Mm-hmm. And then if I sit and think like, what would have happened if that didn't happen, right? Like, mm-hmm. where would I have been? And when I truly appreciate um, what I was saved from, right. man, I mean, I don't mm-hmm. know how you don't just humble yourself. And, right. and and so it's just the natural thing to be like, instead of just thank you, but yeah. like really <laughs> thank you. And so focusing on who God is and also what Jesus has done for me. And the more I understand that, I feel like the more, the closer right. I'm getting to, to actual worship, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, and how it affects my life. Yeah. But Mark Moore said that uh, revelation ought to terrify us into following <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Right. And that's we don't like to think of scaring somebody, mm-hmm. you, you know, into mm-hmm. saying yes to God, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, using hell to scare scare somebody. But and I don't think that's necessarily. I, although Jesus is coming and judgment and wrath, and that ought to be scary if you don't know Him. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm not sure that's ex- that's a part of what more meant. But just the the spectacle mm-hmm. of 
how big God is, how amazing he is. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of, I'm I'm trying to think of uh, these forest fires that sometimes we see. Mm -hmm. And you look at that forest fire and it's all at once dramatic Mm -hmm. and beautiful Mm -hmm. and and cataclysmic. I mean, Mm -hmm. people are losing homes and, (laughs) you know, all that that, that sort of thing. And and, uh, perhaps... You know, the throne room, that scene ought to drive that same sort of emotion mm. in us that there's this really big God and mm. uh, he's worth our worship for sure. He, you know, he's the slain lamb who loves us and yet that that wrath is, is going to be poured out. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Good, good thoughts. Yeah. As far as uh, I'll answer kind of the, just the second half of this uh, question, what is the scene in four and five teaches about worship. Um, really, I, th- I think we saw that kind of demonstrated on Sunday morning. Um, mm-hmm. The especially the the words from chapter five, we ended service really singing through pieces of chapter five, and mm-hmm. um, I've found in the past couple weeks four and five has helped me uh, a couple things, just really prepare my heart and mind for worshiping because I, I started reading the passages ahead of Sunday and, and studying them as well as listening to the music we were going to sing, but really studying them leading up to Sunday helped me just really anticipate and look forward to the time we're going to get together and worship uh, as a church. And so it did that for me. Um, and at the same time, it was also giving me um, words or, or language for my own personal worship. Um, I have a friend that uh, when he prays, it's more um, like liturgical. So Mm -hmm. when he starts his prayer, he says, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He's taken pieces of revelation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I found myself doing that a little bit and using the language that is already Mm -hmm. coming in revelation um, to, um, I guess, shape and form how Mm -hmm. I was worshiping on my own. But but yeah, I, th- I think uh, just really honing in on, on four and five, um, and I hope this has been the experience for our, co- our congregation as well, but uh, just the encouragement and the hope and the joy that comes from this vision, like like Zach said, it's overwhelming and we can't really put it all, comprehend and put it mm-hmm. all together, but at the same time, I hope it gives us uh, an anticipation and a joy coming into worship on Sunday and then just anticipating Mm -hmm. even more so eternity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about just the worship, and I centered on verse 8, right, that says it's – anyway, verse 8 says, And when he had taken the scroll of the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so we have the scene of the 24 elders and the four angels, those creatures, they're armed with harps, right, worshiping him. And then in Revelation chapter 15, kind of everybody has a harp, you Mm -hmm. you know, and these instruments of, of, um, you know, exciting, loud music. Harp maybe doesn't do it for us. Maybe you, we ought to think guitar, right? I, <laughs> yeah. A buddy of mine was at CIY and he posted this picture on Facebook of a young man playing guitar surrounded by <laughs> high school girls, surprised. right? Yeah. yeah. And he said, boys in high school learn to play guitar. He's just saying, and there's, there's something about that, right? Everybody sort of wants to be a rock star at yeah. some level, all those things. And, uh, and we have this chance to, to, to worship with, uh, all out there, mm-hmm. you know. You, you think about David, right, in mm-hmm. front of the, those sorts of things, and and that's maybe what it's a little bit like in in heaven, perhaps. These the prayers of of the saints, the bowls of incense, and and uh, I don't make too much of this. There's some weird theological things people do with this. Sometimes it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. This is just uh, the picture I get is of. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have a, there's a coin jar on my desk. You drop a few quarters in the coin jar, you're saving this coin. And, and you know, the stories of people who, over the years, they go on vacation with the money from their coin mm-hmm. jar or whatever. They're just being saved up and saved up little by little. Mm-hmm. And these bowls of, of incense, you know, when Zechariah and Luke chapter one, you remember this story, the, the angel comes and tells him, you're going to have a son. Uh, John the Baptist, and uh, and he's busy being a priest, 
lighting incense, mm-hmm. and that represented the prayers of God's people. Mm-hmm. And so here, this same picture, right? And it's just it's just the prayers being saved up and saved up by God. You think about all those the times when you think, has God not answered this prayer? Has he said no, or has he said wait? And and even with the coming of Jesus, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Why? What's the deal? You know, and and, uh, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, but God hasn't forgotten that these prayers are are saved up in these bowls, right? They're they're right there in front of him, that he's hearing those things, and and uh, and finally, I just thought, you know, how often do we pray, send Jesus, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That that should be a more prevalent part of our prayer life, that. The, we really, I, I hope and I pray, as we study Revelation, that people walk away from it with it, not being afraid, you know, not being fearful of the future or whatever, mm-hmm. but that they're encouraged, like those seven churches should be encouraged, that Jesus has a hold of us, mm-hmm. that he's, right. you know, that that he's faithful, that mm-hmm. those prayers, are, you know, they're they're in that bowl, you know. Right before God, you know, He sees them, He knows them. He, mm. We can trust Him. All those things. So, um, anyway, th- th- that's those were my ideas about worship. I don't know if they made sense, but that's that's what I was thinking. <laughs> no, yeah, makes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And uh, yeah, as we wrap it up, thank you guys so much. Uh, hopefully, maybe I'll get to host again. Oh, yeah. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> uh, we can't wait to see you guys uh, next week as we go through um, Revelation chapter 6. And, and I'll kind of end with this idea that Lance had said during the sermon, that as we start to get more in the weeds with right. Revelation, where it's it's a little bit uh, more ideas coming mm-hmm. out. Um mm-hmm that we come back to what we see, especially in four and five, mm, yeah. um, that it's about Jesus and worship, uh, Jesus and God. Uh, but as as they are worshiping him, that is our ultimate goal. And mm. that's what it's showing us, that he is victorious uh, and that we could trust in him and, and, and our ultimate plans and goals and, uh, and all of humanity will be us worshiping him. So yeah. as we uh, delve more in, we hold on to that and we look forward to what is to come. So until then, I'll see you guys next week. All right. All right.